Could you possibly beat Pokemon Red if each and every move could only be used in a single battle? I think it's unlikely, but I haven't started yet and there's really only one way to find out. I'd like to explore this topic across the entire series, but I figured I'd start at the very beginning. In Generation 1, only 165 moves existed. This is all there was, and as you can see, the list includes a lot of non-damaging status moves and altogether useless endeavors like Splash. The rules are fairly self-explanatory. If I use a move in battle, after that matchup ends, that move is off-limits for the remainder of the game. If I run out of moves to use, then that will be game over. I won't be using any items in battle, and this challenge basically makes grinding completely infeasible. There's not a lot of room for unnecessary battles here. My strategy is going to be catching Pokemon at the highest possible level and hoping for the best. That's about it. This is being written prior to my attempt, so let's jump into the challenge and see how it goes. The only choice that really makes sense for the starter pick is Squirtle as the water type learns Bubble at level 8. That's our best chance of defeating Brock as Bulbasaur doesn't get Vine Whip until 13. Anyway, the first matchup of the run is against Blue, and as you don't need to win the battle to advance, we just stick to Tail Whip. That means Blue's Bulbasaur picks up the win easily, but we've only burned our status move, so it doesn't really matter. We're gonna need some extra Pokemon if we're planning to make it through Viridian Forest unscathed, starting with a level 5 Spearow on Route 22. The Flying type has access to Peck and Growl already, so there's another two moves in our arsenal. Pidgey is up next, which adds Gust and Sand Attack. Obviously, there's no need to attack here because it's a waste of moves, so instead, for wild encounters, we'll just be throwing balls. Weedle's our last new capture prior to heading through the forest, so now Poison Sting and String Shot are options. Okay, there's only one mandatory battle in Viridian Forest, but our primary goal is to level Squirrusil up to 8, so we'll be doing all three. Against the first bug catcher, we'll be switch training our starter using Pidgey's Gust. Unfortunately, in Gen 1, it's a normal type attack, making this a lot harder than it would be in later generations. The bug catcher's Weedle does leave Pidgey poison, but with only two Pokemon and an obsession with String Shot, Gust is just about enough. Alright, two down, 163 to go. The second trainer in Viridian Forest has a team of three, but this time around we're going to be using Peck. That's still a flying type move, thankfully. I'm not entirely sure why Gust was normal, honestly. Although, Karate Chop was two, so clearly they were still having issues figuring some things out. This battle goes a little better thanks to the super effective move we're using, and by the end, Squirrelsil's reached level eight. Sadly, the remaining battle in Viridian Forest is the only mandatory one, but it's worth the least experience out of them all, so I think the other two were necessary to get us Bubble. The final Forest Trainer has just a single level 9 Weedle, and I don't want to lose Tackle just yet, so we're going to be trying to pass the battle with Poison Sting. Our bug is only level 5 though, so we're going to have to make use of Sand Attack and Growl too. After Pidgey and Spearow burn their status moves, we switch in Weedle whose quote-unquote super effective Poison Sting is good for… one hit point of damage. I suppose it's lucky that the bug catchers in Viridian Forest really love String Shot because it took 27 uses of Poison Sting to get over the line. That's actually the only mandatory battle between Oak Slab and Brock, so it's time to see if a level 8 Squirtle is enough to earn us the Boulder Badge. For those keeping track, Tail Whip, Gust, Peck, Sand Attack, Growl, and Poison Sting are the only moves we've used. Everything else is still available to us. Bubble isn't quite enough to take down Geodude in one, so Brock's first Pokemon gets off a tackle, but it doesn't hit too hard. After Bubble finishes off Geodude, Brock sends out his Onyx and calls for Screech. We switch out following a quad effective Bubble because of the defense drop, but it was unnecessary. Onyx uses Bide instead of attacking, so when Squirrel rejoins the battle, Bubble hands us the win. Alright, that's one badge down and seven moves burned, but Brock hands over the TM for Bide, so we've got an extra attack to use. That'll probably be required with four mandatory battles standing between us and the next patch of grass. If we can make it past them though, there's new Pokemon with new moves waiting for us on the other side. Before we get into it, we need to add Rattata, who's only a couple of levels away from learning Quick Attack, Pikachu, who's equipped with the unused Thundershock, and Nidoran Male, who'll have use of Horn Attack at level 8. In hindsight, I probably should have caught a couple of these earlier, but what can you do? For the first trainer on Route 3, I decided to finally make use of Tackle, so this one was nice and easy. Squirtle is easily powerful enough to carry us through the battle while helping Nidoran level up too. When the bug catcher's final Pokemon goes down, Nidoran reaches level 8 and learns Horn Attack. Next up, we've got the Shorts Enthusiast, and his level 11 Rattata won't be easy to make it past. It's always a good challenge when a Pokemon like that is posing a big threat. I settled on slowing it down with String Shot before switching into Squirtle to use the newly taught Bide. Rattata deals 24 HP of damage, which Squirtle doubles up and unleashes back at the Route 1 Rodent. 
That's easily enough to wipe out Rattata, but now our start is down to 8 HP with Bide as its only form of attack. So, not ideal. We get absolutely nowhere with that strategy against the youngster's Ekans, who has the terrifying power of Gen 1 Rap at its disposal. Without Bide on hand, we also have to use Horn Attack here, which makes this the first battle where we've had to use multiple damage dealing moves. Nidoran Male is ultimately able to get us the win with Horn Attack, but that didn't go very well. We use String Shot, Bide, and Horn Attack against the youngster, which leaves us with only a handful of remaining options. And the hand in that handful has lost several fingers to Frostbite. Outside of the team, we could grab a Kakuna or Metapod in the forest and battle against another second stage bug to exhaust Harden and give ourselves Struggle. It would only be level 6 though, and Struggle is really bad in Gen 1. That just leaves Leer and Thundershock, so we sort of need Pikachu to sweep here. After several attempts, Pikachu does make it past Weedle unscathed, but beyond just winning this battle, we need to get Rattata up to level 7 so it can access Quick Attack. Obviously, the Cocoon and Metapod don't pose a threat, but we still need some luck against Caterpie. After spending several minutes getting ourselves a free switch into Pikachu, we finally get to the face-off which will decide our fate. Thanks to the bug catcher calling for String Shot twice, Pikachu makes it through one hit from death. When Pikachu takes down Metapod, Rattata levels up and learns Quick Attack, so we've got something to use in the final unavoidable Route 3 battle. Once again, we're fairly reliant on a bug catcher having an affinity for String Shot. They really do love it. As we're only using Quick Attack, it's even more pointless than usual. Rattata breezes past Caterpie, leading just a Metapod, who only has Harden. So it wasn't pretty, but we're 13 moves in and the run's not dead yet. We're stuck with only Leer now though, so let's catch some new Pokemon. The only new move we can acquire on Route 3 is Jigglypuff Sing, but that could play a big part at some point down the road, so we add it to our growing group. Then comes Mount Moon. In the deepest depths of the cave, we catch three level 12 Pokemon. A Zubat who knows Leech Life and Supersonic, a Paris who only has Scratch, and after a whole lot of searching, a Clefairy who's got Pound. Once we've made all of those additions, we pick up TM12, which contains Water Gun, TM1, aka Mega Punch, and a Moonstone, which we can use right away if we want. Now, there's actually only two mandatory battles in Mount Moon, so let's get into those. The plan for the first one was to get through it with just Leech Life and Supersonic, but that was probably too much to ask considering the rocket had two Pokemon, one of which was just a higher level Zubat. When you look at it like that, our Zubat really did quite well. It knocked out Rattata and took Zubat below half health before going down. Unfortunately, that means we're forced to burn another move, that being Scratch. Paris finishes off the Rocket Grunt with its only attack, and we are getting worryingly short on moves now. To make things go a little smoother with the Fossil Craving Super Nerd, we use our Moonstone on Clefairy, causing it to evolve. Clefable isn't exactly the strongest fully evolved Pokemon, but for this point in the game, it should give us a big advantage. We start the Super Nerd battle by softening up Grimer with Nidoran's Leer, and then, after a disable, switch in Clefable. Thanks to Grimer's overuse of disable, we're forced to switch in and out a few times, but Pound eventually gets us past the Poison type. When Voltorb joins the battle, we go back out to Nidoran and plump for a healthy dose of prolonged eye contact. Nidoran just keeps leering until it can leer no more, falling to a Voltorb tackle. Clefable comes back out, and thanks to the prolonged eye contact, two strikes of Pound are enough to take the Super Nerd down to one. There's no longer the option to use leer against coughing, so it's all up to Clefable and Pound. It comes down to the wire with Clefable poisoned and low on health, but the fairy Pokemon manages to pick up the win. Okay, we've made it through Mount Moon. That's pretty good. On Route 4, we grab TM4, which is the TM4 Encore. Nope, that didn't exist yet. It just rhymed. It's actually Whirlwind, so that's entirely useless. In Gen 1, it didn't even force your opponent to switch out. It literally served no purpose in trainer battles. Gen 1 is such a mess. I love it. After hopping down the ledge into Cerulean City, we head for the nearby grass because there's another Pokemon for us to catch. It's there that we can find Ekans, whose rap attack is just about the best move in existence at this point. Our list of move options is running seriously short, so I'd even take Gen 2 rap at this point, but the broken Gen 1 version is certainly preferable. We can either take on Blue here or visit the gym, so let's just hope rap's broken enough to get us to Misty. The gym trainer guarding her just has a single level 19 Goldeen, but our team is mostly around level 12, so we're a bit underleveled. We lead off with Jigglypuff, who succeeds in putting Goldeen to sleep with Zing, and then switch out to Ekans and call for Rap. If you've never had the joy, and or despair, of experiencing Generation 1 Rap, just look at this thing of beauty. Our level 12 Ekans just ties up Goldeen, tearing through it until it can't move. Sometimes for 5 straight turns. Who thought this was fair? 
Towards the end of the battle, I had to bring in Clefable to ensure it got the experience required to reach 13, and then let Ekans finish this total decimation. That takes Sing and Rap off the table, but we really needed that win. After using our HP up, two rare candies, and Mega Punch TM on Clefable, we go to the gym leader to see what we can do. We get lucky with a critical hit right away, which renders her starting X defend completely useless. So, Clefable makes it boss Staryu with only six hit points missing. When Starmie enters, Misty calls for Water Gun instead of Bubble Beam for literally no other reason than to be nice. We're fairly reliant on Opposition Pity in this run. After a Mega Punch connects, Starmie's attempted tackle flies wide of the mark. There's really no reason for her not to be using Bubble Beam here, but it's very much appreciated. Another X Defend is met by a Clefable Haymaker that takes the star down to around a quarter health. Misty opts for Water Gun again, allowing Clefable to swing once more, but we're now into one-shot range to either water move, both of which have just a 1 in 256 chance of missing. Thankfully, and I have no idea why, Misty calls for the only move that doesn't have a 99.6% chance of winning her the battle. So Clefable strikes true with one final Mega Punch, knocking out Starmie to earn us the Cascade Badge. I really didn't think we could win that one. In the end though, it only took like an hour to get lucky. 21 moves down, 144 to go. After the loss, Misty hands over the TM for Bubble Beam, a move that she clearly hates, and we can continue on. We teach the move to Clefable, who's basically our only viable Pokemon now, and then head north to initiate our second battle with Blue. Pidgeotto's his first Pokemon out, and although it deals some decent damage, four blasts of Bubble Beam take it down. Abra's up second, but the Psychic type literally can't attack, so there's nothing to worry about there. We get an extremely unnecessary critical hit on our way to the win, and then comes Rattata. Bubble Beam's good for a two-shot there, so we make it to Blue's Bulbasaur with 41 hit points remaining. The not very effective Water-type attack is slower going against the Grass Starter, who's not up to much offense-wise. It can't even chip away half of Clefable's remaining HP before being knocked out, leaving Blue without any usable Pokémon. Sadly, he tells us to go visit Bill, so we can't leave Cerulean City just yet. That's really not good news. There are Pokemon for us to catch with new moves just across Nugget Bridge, but there are six unskippable battles between us and them. The only damage dealing move that we have left is Water Gun, so I'm not feeling great about our chances here. Clefable blows past the Bug Catcher's Caterpie and Weedle, but that burns Water Gun, meaning we are completely out of attacks. The only move we have left is Whirlwind, which can't even be used in a trainer battle. So this is the end of the run. It's a bit disappointing, but I'm pretty happy I made it this far even. I could try it in different ways, but I think Nugget Bridge is the end of the line in red and blue no matter what. Other than a Cocoon or Metapod struggle, there aren't any attacks that I could have easily accessed. With a lot of focus on switch training, we might have been able to get one of Hyper Fang, Fury Attack or Bite, but that would have been a stretch. I think it would have required switch training against Misty and Blue, which probably wasn't going to be possible. Considering I needed at least four more damage dealing moves, I don't think there was any way of getting across that bridge. There were two battles where I was forced to use multiple attacks, but even so, I think getting through Route 24 may be impossible. Anyway, I wanted to start in Gen 1 to get across the idea of this challenge, but if people are interested, I'd like to try it in other generations. In Gen 2, the number of moves went from 165 to 251, so right away I think we could go further. There are also far fewer mandatory trainer battles early on, so it seems like a better game to attempt this challenge. If people aren't interested though, I'm happy to leave it be. In the end, we used up 23 of the 165 possible moves, and that only took us to two badges. We could have used Whirlwind, Splash, Heart, and Struggle without really changing anything, but that's about it. So yeah, this is pretty short for this kind of video, but I only made it to Cerulean City, so it wasn't exactly going to be long. Leave a comment if you'd like to see me try this in Pokemon Crystal, or if you wouldn't. Either way, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.